Good morning, again. Uh, we're pleased to have you uh, join us uh, for this session uh, organized on uh, Narratives of the Self, uh, the uh, first year uh, core curriculum sequential course. Um, I teach in that course and had the pleasure of um, having a, a very fine class last semester and uh, four of my students have uh, agreed to uh, share with you some of the work that they've uh, done on the um, common texts that we have in the course in the first semester. And so you will be hearing some uh, short presentations on um, taken from uh, papers written on uh, the Odyssey, on uh, uh, Plato's The Apology and Phaedo, and on uh, Hamlet, the Shakespeare play that we uh, studied this year. Um, we will follow that with a uh, discussion of our uh, panelists, um, or the uh, students will form a panel where they will um, uh, interact with each other. Uh, and then we will uh, give the uh, audience an opportunity to uh, also uh, participate and ask questions. Um, the uh, uh, intent is uh, to focus on these texts from the fall semester, but as we continue on with the conversation, uh, we could talk more generally about the two semesters of Narratives of the Self and perhaps about the core in general. Uh, Students will be welcome to uh, share their own uh, experience with these texts and the course, and uh, uh, guests are welcome to ask uh, questions of our uh, participants and um, questions about the course. So I'm um, uh, very pleased to um, uh, present you the um, four students who will each present their work and shortly introduce themselves. And at that point, um, my uh, 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 task has finished, and I will let our first student start. Hello, everybody. Good morning. I'd like to thank you, first of all, for the interest in our panel. And my name is Lydia Diaz. I'm a biology major, pre-med. And core uh, narratives of the self is one of my favorite classes, not only because it takes a break from all of the biology and chemical and chemistry and all of those stuff into something different, something philosophical, something thought provoking, something very different. You know, it takes you away from who you are. And as our keynote speaker said this morning, you know, it, it's different. You concentrate on something, and it's to me, it's been a great experience. I'm going to be discussing about the Odyssey. In narratives of the self, we discuss about who we are as a person and how we differentiate ourselves from, I guess, the whole of a society from just ourselves. And we see how different works of, for example, the Odyssey, how it's so old and everybody knows about it, everybody has heard about it, yet we see something distinctive about who we are as people. Everybody knows Odysseus, uh, godlike Telemachus, but one of the things that we don't see in the Odyssey is the role of females, the role of women in the book. And we have three very important people that I think pop out when we read. Penelope, of course, circumspect, faithful. She waited for Odysseus as, she came back, as he came back. We have Euryclea, a nurse, who after she discovers who Odysseus is, keeps quiet. She doesn't reveal who he is. And we have Melantho, who's a servant maid, who is very bad. You know, she, it's said that she sleeps around with the people who are trying, the suitors who are trying to take over uh, Odysseus's kingdom, empire. And we see a huge difference in what Homer believed was a good woman and a bad woman. And whenever I read any work, in the narratives of the self, I can't help thinking that I am the person who is writing and thinking what that person is thinking. This semester we're reading Sartre and he believes, you know, I'm here, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to build my own uh, essence on what I choose it to be. Then we read um, Nietzsche and he's like, everything that we've read, everything that we know is false. Why am I supposed to believe it? And then I see the Odyssey, and it's like, well, this is what a woman should be. This is what Homer is saying. Women should be faithful. They should be quiet. When Telemachus tells Penelope, go to your room and stop crying, women are supposed to do that. And I can't, I, I have to disagree with that. 
And I see that Homer unintentionally created another figure, a figure that begins the poem. If we read the very first page of the poem, it's an invocation to a muse, and that muse is Athena. If you read the end of the book, it says, and all, let me just read it for you, proof, and pledges for the days to come, sworn by both sides, were settled by Pallas, Athene, daughter of Zeus. So we begin the poem, and we finish the poem with Athena. Athena is one of the most important characters then, not Odysseus. Athena is the one that helps Od uh, Odysseus travel through all these perils. He's always defending him, sticking up for him, you know, under Zeus or Poseidon, who constantly try to inflict pain or setbacks on Odysseus. And I think, I don't think Homer meant to create Athena, because Athena is not, cha uh, she's not faithful. She doesn't wait for people. She doesn't wait on men. She doesn't say, Sue said this, so therefore I shall do it. No, she has her own mind. She believes that Odysseus is right, so she's going to help Odysseus. She believes that Telemachus should set out on an adventure, so she tells Telemachus, go look for your father, when she could have just told him, look, your father's still alive. She says, go look for him. So Athena is... Uh, intentional, unintentional, because I don't think Homer meant for any woman to, to go about, to go on her own, to not trust men, to not do what men tell her. But even though Athena is this great character who moves the story of the flow, even though she has her own mind, even though she's very, she begins the story and she ends it, I don't think that's the woman that any woman should aspire to be. I think that a woman, when it comes to narratives to the self, that concept of who am I, what am I supposed to do, I think that that woman would be someone like Odysseus, a woman of Odysseus equal, a woman who says, who goes out, who makes mistakes, and says, I made a mistake, but I can fix it, a woman who goes to war and then is lost away from home for 10 years, but can plan in her mind and say, I will come back sets her mind to come back and makes it back. A woman who, maybe not this particular example exactly, but a woman who is unfaithful, but then in her heart she's like, oh, but in my heart I've been faithful. She doesn't get labeled with, you have to be faithful. She doesn't get labeled with, you have to be quiet. A woman who can shout to the Cyclops, oh, look, I am the great Odysseus. I am the great person that tricked you and now I'm getting away. A woman that can do that, I think, is a woman that I aspire to be, and I think that any woman should aspire to be, because Odysseus is a hero. When you think of Homer, you think of Achilles, you think of Odysseus, and men want to be like them. Well, what about women? I think that a woman equal to Odysseus is an excellent woman with great virtues, with faults and strengths. And also, I think that woman in the Odyssey as in a lot of works of art, but particularly in this Odyssey, is great because the reason why the, this war started was because of a woman, Helen. And the reason why Odysseus wants to get back is because of a woman, again. He wants to get back to Helen. No, not Helen. What is Penelope? There we go. So I think that women are just entangled all over this Odyssey, and I think that narratives of the self for me, not only is it a break from biology and chemistry, but it also helps me think of who I am as a person, who am I as a student, and who am I as a woman. And this Odyssey has been, it's great. Um, I love it. Not only this one, but also other works that we've read throughout the semester, like Hamlet and um, a lot of Shakespeare work and Montaigne, people who question everything, you know, who am I, why am I here, what am I supposed to do, where am I going, and I think that everyone should, everybody should think that at least once in their life, have a set goal and go for it, and not be defined by what other people believe, and this is my part on the Odyssey, and I hope you've enjoyed it. Hi everybody, my name is Mariah Emerson, and I'm a freshman. Um, I'm a pre-medical Spanish major, and um, I really enjoyed uh, CORE last semester. Um, I think I have a greater appreciation for it this semester than I did last semester. <laughs> um, uh, I think I really liked the works that we did and the books that we did more last semester than the ones that I did this semester, and I didn't think that that would be true because 
um, I knew that we were going in a chronological order and I was just ready to get to the things that were a lot more recent. But um, after reading the Odyssey and especially reading like Hamlet, I had a really good appreciation for older works. So um, the paper that I wrote was um, about romantic love in Hamlet. And I guess I'll start with reading part of my introduction. Um, basically, in the, in the paper, I talked about like authenticity of love and the question of love in Hamlet because uh, throughout Hamlet, love was seen as a struggle. Um, and many times, the relationships within Hamlet were evaluated to see if they were real, if they were authentic, or if it was really just a struggle between class and um, truth. So I guess I'll just start. Um, the question of authenticity of love is brought up many times as a way to verify why or why not romantic relationships should or should not and do or do not exist in the plot. Two relationships are analyzed many times for the validity of love, Hamlet and Ophelia's and then the king and the queen's. While Hamlet and Ophelia deal with the morality of their love due to class difference and ideological stances, the king and the queen's relationship is evaluated for morality based on the idea that the, king him, that the king himself killed Hamlet's father, the queen's deceased hub, husband. In the play, romantic love is characterized as a symbol of conflict, struggle, and hassle, as deceit and authenticity, authenticity drive the character's mood towards its presence. So um, in Hamlet, I viewed love more as a character itself instead of um, just an emotion or a noun. I, I viewed it as something that basically drove the plot. Um, many times love was something that Hamlet considered. He spent a lot of time questioning it. He spent a lot of time wondering what love was. And because of the situations that he was placed in, um, the pain that he felt from losing his father, and then the feelings that he felt from being seen by his father's ghost and speaking to his father's ghost, those things messed with his head, and they skewed his idea of love. And from that, he started to not believe in love as, as much. And um, reading this book made me think about current times, because um, I think a lot of Shakespeare pieces actually can be translated into our current day. Like, you look at Hamlet, and many people, especially our age, we try to figure out, you know, who's the person that we're going to be with, and do we love the person that we're with? And a lot of times when bad things happen, we start to question what love really is. And we, we look at love, um, even growing up, like love between our parents or love within our family, like familiar love. And we try to figure out which, which love is right. And I feel like that's something that even Hamlet struggled with. And the fact that this idea and this struggle is something that has happened from um, multiple years before to even this day and age, like we still struggle with that idea. That's something that's really important to me. So um, in the beginning, like the first time that Ophelia speaks, like, her, like what she talks about is a question of love. Um, like romantic love is initially presented negatively in act one. It's never presented in a very positive manner. Her first, um, her first question in terms of Hamlet in general is do you doubt that? Um, asking if, he, if anyone doubts that he truly loves her. And she is always searching to see if the love that he has for her is real. She asks from her father and her brother and they tell her no and then that starts to change their relationship and then you have to look at the relationship between her and Hamlet and how that is starting to dismantle. And then it gets worse because Hamlet is looking at his, um, his mother and, his, and, well, his father's murderer, and he doesn't see love anymore. So he starts to tell her, well, you know, I don't love you. I loved you once, but I don't love you anymore. And that completely shatters her. So romantic love in Hamlet is something that I think definitely played a large part along with deceit and um, just confusion in general. Um, another thing that I wanted to read was actually from like the end of my paper. Okay. I said, um, in the play, romantic love is viewed as not present, not real, or as a manner of concealing other issues such as madness. It affects the characters in multiple ways, causing issues between familiar relationships, that of Polinius and Ophelia, 
Laertes and Ophelia, and Hamlet and Gertrude, but it also creates a precedence that causes it to become a character in itself. Romantic love is a personal, political, and ideological struggle throughout Hamlet. And while the importance of romantic love is so strong, love so strongly influences how the plot is driven, the character's lack of viewing it as authentic serves as a basis to the relationships within the plot, which causes turmoil and distraught situations throughout. And I think these ideas are something that we see not only in Hamlet, but in other works. We see it in fiction and we see it in nonfiction. It's something that we deal with every day in life, and so you see it in lots of literature. Um, even in other pieces that we looked at and other books and works that we looked at throughout the semester, the idea of love um, definitely sh was shown. Even in Plato, like the way that Plato viewed love or didn't view love um, was something very interesting to me. Or um, we also read a piece from Africa um, called Sundiata, and we looked at love within um, that family too and how um, relationships throughout family and how love is, you know, transmissible. Um, I think love is something that's very interesting in, lit in literature throughout, especially in terms of narrative, uh, narratives of the self because I believe that is an innate part of who we are as humans. So when we look at who we are as humans, we need to realize, like, how do we feel about that? How do we handle that as a society or how do even greater, like globally, how do we feel about love? And I think that at Oglethorpe, the core program brings up that question and many other questions as well. So I really appreciate that. Hi, my name's, wait, can you hear me? All right. Hi, my name's Amber Nicole Hart. Um, I'm an international studies major, and I was also in Dr. Lutz's class for Narratives of the Self, and I really enjoyed it because he sort of took us into, like, we went from Sundiata, Homer, Plato, Montana, all these different things that taught us all these different lessons. But my favorite one uh, was in Homer. I also did a paper about women. And, um, in the Odyssey, these women, uh, you see all the men, they're workers, they're soldiers, they're crewmen, they're always in action. But these women that he shows, they're wives, they're goddesses and divinities. So right then, uh, when you look into the novel, there's an obvious divide in the roles of men and women. And um, as Homer already has a patriarchal view of the women that he shows, but there is a deviation in the position and nature that he uses with different women in the book. So uh, the women that are mothers and wives and these lovers, they're sort of held in this different light than uh, seductresses like Circe and the sirens to the counselors and goddesses like Athena. And so I sort of uh, laid out my work to going to sort of the least valued women, how they see, to the most important, which would be Athena. And so uh, Homer puts out that these women need to stay in their place, such as these mothers and these, their wives, like it's a God-given duty. And um, he sort of puts it on women that, from this quote, that she wants to build up the household of the man, marry her and of former children and of her beloved and wedded husband. And already sort of putting this want on women to build up a household, to have children for her beloved and wedded husband, uh, so just attaching this role to the wives and the women of the Odyssey is already showing that stereotypical role of women uh, that we've seen throughout different cultures and of time and even until now that a woman should be attached to her household and that her uh, duty should be to her husband and children. And Homer uses parallels the stories of Agamemnon and Clymestria. Uh, with Odysseus and Penelope to show uh, a woman of virtue to a woman uh, that basically dishonored the whole race of women, essentially. Uh, the responsibility to the husbands is the crux of their existence, essentially. And Penelope is described as all too virtuous and her mind is stored in good thoughts because she waits for Odysseus at home for the 10 years that he's gone to come back. Even though the suitors are in her home, she never once strays. She basically uh, weaves and unweaves waiting for this man to come back. But as you see with Clymestria and um, Agamemnon, 
uh, directly, they say she is an act of dishonor and she has splashed shame on herself and the rest of herself. One woman still to come, even on the one whose act are virtuous. And right then, that's sort of the stereotypical role of how uh, even now, how if there's one, uh, we plant stereotypes on women. So if you have one who we see like people who may sell their bodies or aren't faithful, how uh, in society we'll place that on all women, which is entirely wrong as Homer says that she splashed shame on not only herself, but her entire sex. And um, Penelope, in a sense, is idolized for her faithfulness and her commitment to Odysseus, whereas Clymestra broke the bond of marriage and betrayed her husband, which even Agamemnon in his death, when he sees uh, Odysseus, uh, basically tells Odysseus that he's so lucky to have uh, Penelope because she remembered him well and how his wife uh, made an evil reputation of mankind. Uh, once again. So even there you see that that parallel story shows that a woman who is virtuous, who does the stereotypical role of uh, waiting on her husband, uh, having his uh, children, obeying his every whim, is what uh, Homer sees as the woman of that time, and even now some people believe is the woman that we should all be. And uh, moving on, the uh, physical location of even these women show that women need men to be stable. Uh, Penelope stays at home and waits for Odysseus, which is a stable location as Odysseus goes place to place for 10 years. And uh, even going further, even uh, the goddess that he is lured into, like Circe and the Sirens, they're in a specific location. And it doesn't matter if they bring the men in between by bond of marriage or, sec or seducing or luring them, they still need to obtain that male. So there's a constant, again, stereotypical thing that a woman needs a man to be stable, that they can't leave outside the home, outside the house, or be okay without a male, which um, still perpetuates us to society today. And even uh, that role of a male in need for a male when Odysseus leaves, Telemachus is still over his mother. Uh, he tells her to go to her room, stop crying. And that's sort of weird for a son to be able to step on his mother and say, Mom, you need to go do this. But uh, when you look at it from this perspective that Homer's giving, it's that he's still a male. Therefore, he can tell his mother what to do. Um, and in a sense, it's sort of disrespectful, but then again, just perpetuating that same male dominance over women. And um, then also these stereotypical things like loom and staff uh, that are woman's work that she needs to go back to. Again, just perpetuating this same stereotype that a woman should be at home and uh, doing what she needs to do, keeping up her household. And again, like Calypso, uh, she's on the island and she lures Odysseus in. Again, a need for a male presence that Homer perpetuates uh, in his novel. And uh, also with Circe and the Sirens. Circe and the Sirens are called beautiful women. The Sirens lure men in with their beautiful songs, telling men to go apart from their wives. Uh, Circe, they say she has lovely hair and she's beautiful. And these women are clever and resourceful in a sense, that even though they're using their beauty to get by, they still were almost able to uh, get Odysseus to end his journey and never go back to Penelope. But at the end of the day, there's still a masculine dominance over because, of course, he overcomes both Calypso and the Sirens. And uh, then their beauty is then turned into uh, malevolent guiles and evil drugs of the Sirens' beauty and Calypso's luring to give Odysseus eternal life, basically, for staying with her. So even though these women could outsmart a man or be more resourceful than a man, they are still put under him because their resourcefulness is turned into something negative. And then lastly, we can move to Athena. And she's a wonderful goddess who basically helps Odysseus on his journey. And even her, in the beginning of the book, has to plead to Zeus and the gods to go help Odysseus. And even though she's a goddess way above women, way above Circe, Penelope, the sirens, she still has to answer to a man. And uh, no matter all the things that she did for Odysseus, Odysseus still doubts her because she is a woman. And uh, she takes upon the form of mentor, which is a man, which again shows that even though this goddess is resourceful, even though she's led Odysseus through so many adventures and things, led his son, that she still can't compare to a man. Therefore, she has to come 
in a male presence to even be recognized sort of by Odysseus for her to even, for him to trust her. And she, and anger comes from this because she's a divine goddess and Odysseus, a mere human who she could have let basically just fall into the earth, she's there helping him and there's still doubt within him. And basically just the male dominance in every situation that I've mentioned uh, just shows that Homer does perpetuate a stereotypical role for women. But though true, he allows a sort of like different nuances for women to show that yes, they are clever, yes, they are resourceful, yes, they can do so many things, but yet he still allows this perpetuating woman's role, stereotypical patriarchal role in the Odyssey. So uh, just basically like what I got from just like researching and studying is that um, even though Homer does this, it does show that there's that value in women that even back then Homer had to say a woman can get that much farther than the man. And I feel like taking even this and run with it, and I feel that women should be more forward thinking and show that, okay, if I'm Penelope in the house, I'm virtuous or whatever, I can still get out there and do what I have to do. Or even the Athenas of the world, like don't let that barrier stop you with the societal roles of what a woman should do. Cause I know I'm definitely not going to them. <laughs> but thank you so much. Morning. My name is Gary McGinty. I'm a freshman here at Oglethorpe. I'm a business major. Um, I feel very official up here in my suit and tie and uh, on this panel discussion. Um, it's an honor to be here. Uh, kind of the, a little bit of backstory. Um, this paper that I'm about to present on was the last paper of the semester that we did, and uh, the one prior to that was probably the worst I had done on a paper all year. I did very poorly on it. The arguments I made were unconvincing. The, I feel like it read not very well. Um, we had many discussions about this. I was not happy with my grade. So I was asking the question, what should I do to get a good paper, you know, in strong type, type thing. So I, uh, I thought, I write about the, what, what, what makes a good writer is, is, is writing about what I'm passionate about, writing about what I know. You know, you can see that in the ladies here, how, you know, they've taken something that they feel strongly about and they've written on it and they've obviously done well. They've obviously thought deeply about it. So that's kind of the uh, attitude I had going into this, this final paper on uh, Plato and Socrates and I... Uh, took to a prompt <clears throat> on religion. So um, I'm presenting on Socrates and religion, which is kind of daunting and intimidating. Um, but as I was reading uh, this guy, you know, these philosophers, you know, like I said, it's intimidating stuff. It's, you know, thinking deeply about life. It's thinking deeply about uh, why we're here, what we're doing, and my faith informs how I process these decisions, you know, how I process these questions. Um, it informs how I think about these things. And so, and, and, and after reading uh, the Apology and, and Phaedo, um, I think that, the, that religion um, very much informed how Plato and Socrates processed uh, the thoughts and observations that they had. Um, so, I will be using my paper, which I did get an A on, by the way, um, <laughs> to, to kind of illustrate that. Um, I, begin, I begin the paper by saying religion is often inflammatory. It's divided nations, fueled wars, and reshaped generations. Um, these things, you know, are, are, you know, we see it throughout history, you know, how divisive or how, you know, life-altering religion can be. And, uh, Socrates' student Plato, um, in his works, The Apology and, and Phaedo, um, illustrate that Socrates as well was a man keenly aware of the supernatural, of spiritual things. So he, he explores the life-altering implications, the power to provoke truth and goodness, and, and, and these things that Socrates felt very strongly about. 
in the Apology, kind of the setting for that is, 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 is Socrates being tried before an Athenian jur jury um, who accused him of corrupting the youth and having uh, false or unconventional ideas on God or the supernatural. Um, Miletus, chief accuser of the Athenian jury, claimed that Socrates, quote, believed in supernatural things of his own invention instead of the gods recognized by the state. This is pretty big deal back then, you know? It's, he is on a trial uh, that could and eventually does result in his death. <clears throat> so in, in his defense, though, uh, Socrates does not, he doesn't go over to the side of the Athenians. He doesn't recant anything that he believes, even when faced with death. So my question is, why did he do that? Why would he make such choices, knowing that the likely consequence is death? You know, he has these charges before him, and he sort of hastily defends himself. You know, he does, you know, he proves that he does believe in gods, and Socrates would be wise then to show that his beliefs didn't vary too dramatically from these guys who were wanting to kill him. And Socrates makes no such case. Um, he believed something different, and he believed that strongly, strong enough to where he thought, I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not coming back from, from, from these things. Um, he said that, uh, that suppose, this, and this is kind of the, the big quote that I, that I would use, he says, suppose in view of this, <clears throat> He says, suppose in view of this, you said to me, Socrates, on this occasion, we shall acquit you, but only on one condition, that you give up spending your time on this quest and stop philosophizing. If we catch you going on in the same way, you shall be put to death. Well, supposing, as I said, that you should offer to acquit me on these terms, I shall reply, gentlemen, I'm your very grateful and devoted servant, but I owe a greater obedience to God than to you. And so long as I draw breath and have my faculties, I shall never stop practicing philosophy and exhorting you and indicating the truth for everyone that I meet. Socrates used this illustration of him as a fly on a st uh, stinging the horse of uh, this culture, this, this horse of Athens or Greece, um, provoking it towards thought and conviction regarding these things. And, and he's, he would do that even when faced with death. Um, he stood firm in what he believed in, and this is, this is kind of my, my final thoughts. This is how I closed the paper. He said that even, even when faced with death, ultimately, Socrates' views of God and the soul and the afterlife left him without fear. He sought to meet his obligation and personal burden to present truth and stimulate the culture towards knowledge and goodness. One author states, Socrates thought himself called by God in a, div uh, in a given direction and nothing would persuade him to change. This is the sort of conviction that, that I think that applies to us, you know, whether, you know, whatever we believe about God or, or about women or anything like that as we defend it, to I think, you know, this is kind of what got me excited is that we should be, have that sort of passion, we should have that sort of conviction. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying we're all going to be faced with death, but you know what I mean, to where we believe strongly about things and have conviction. Um, about what we think truth is and to think deeply about such things. And so, you know, I, I was just, you know, really excited about how Socrates, you know, what, was no coward, you know, and, and, and believed what he believed even in the face of death. So, um, you know, I thought that was, that was good stuff. So thank you. Thank you, all four of you, for very fine presentations. I'm very proud of you. Um, what I've uh, asked the students to do is to uh, uh, discuss among themselves, first of all, for a short period of time, responding to what uh, they've uh, presented today. Also, I said uh, that we might move into uh, additional comments about the texts uh, in narratives in 
the particular course last fall or in the course in general or how these uh, various readings uh, fit together or don't fit together or are uh, what some of uh, the issues are that uh, perhaps we can identify some common issues from these presentations. So it's really kind of open-ended and uh, now is your time to talk among yourselves and I'm going to leave you on your own. <laughs> Okay. Um, I don't know where to start. Where do you start? Do, uh, do be close to a mic. Oh, okay. I have a question. Okay. So I'm interested to like hear the comparison of y'all's papers because I know you guys both have this had the same topic, but I'm just like really like it seems like you guys had you approached it in two different ways. So I'm really interested to see like your takes on it in terms of. Um, what you wrote about and then yours and then how those fit or don't fit together. I think we both, um, we both touched on the, the stereotypes of women and how Homer, like you mentioned how he, women were supposed to stay at home, be faithful, have a family. And I sort of touched on that when I mentioned Penelope and how, you know, there is a set fixed pattern for women and how they should be. And then I think we took different roles on Athena where you, yeah. You also mentioned her as, even though she was a goddess, she still had to, like, you know, answer to men. Whereas I said that she was unintentionally, by Homer, you know, she was something new. She wasn't like the other woman because even though it is true that she pleaded to the gods, the gods said no, but she still said, you know, she still went through it. So I think that our biggest difference in our analyzation was in Athena. But I think it works both ways because Yes, she did answer to men, but yes, she was very different from the other woman. And in the end, I said that a woman should, you know, maybe someone to Odysseus is equal is a woman that, you know, Homer didn't create. And you said that the woman that, you know, you weren't going to be like the <laughs> woman that we're fixed at. So I think there are different ways because, you know, Athena, we definitely analyzed her differently. But I think it's sort of the same yeah. I, have a, I have a thought kind of in that same vein. Um, you. you mentioned the stereotypical roles of a woman, and I think you kind of specifically said that her duty should be for her husband and children and saying that that's kind of been what has been, you know, that's the stereotype that people embrace, uh, the majority. Um, I kind of have a question about that. Is that, would y'all, all three of y'all, you know, this idea that a, that a woman's role is to be in the household, you know, having children with her husband. Is that necessarily, is that a low view of women always? You know, like I think the exclusivity, like if that's exclusively how you view women, that they should only be in the house, that that's, that's not very good. But like, speak a little bit on, on that, I don't know. Exactly, that's not a very good question, but, you know, do you gotta get the gist? Yeah. That's a good question. Um, I sort of feel like, if it's exclusively like the woman should say house, husband, and children, uh, that that's totally wrong, but I do think there is value for a mother in her home, uh, because a mom is a rock, like my mom is my rock, and I feel like a woman should have that connection with her husband, and like faithfulness, that should be both ways, virtuous, both ways, things like that, and I think it's really important uh, for a mother to be in that position, but I don't think that we should limit women to just that. And I think like even now, I feel like it's not always uh, women staying in your house with their husband and children, but it's sort of like still lean toward what the males want. Cause I just through like I just thought of social media and about how a lot of people will post a bunch of pictures talking about like a girlfriend like this or someone who does that and you'll have a bunch of people uh, posting it again and again like oh this is me oh this is like what I do and I feel like even though it's not the exact same some uh, women are still like adhering to that social construct of even though it's not that traditional uh, I have to be connected to house and husband but still okay this is what all the guys want or all the men want at this time so I'm gonna show myself in that light so that um, I can go toward that. It, makes, it also makes me think of Flawless by Beyonce when the ladies like we compete for husbands or whatever and like 
just uh, perpetuate that, like competing for the men that are around us by adhering to what they want us to do. So anything that like falls under that, I think, is uh, shouldn't be connected to women, like keeping them in that box. I also think, I don't want to change the subject on women, but I also see that the same thing happened to Socrates because with Homer you have these men who are warriors, who are strong, and then you have Socrates who isn't trying to portray himself as someone who's strong. On the contrary, he's saying, I, I'm, not, I'm not even a smart guy, you know. I know everything, but I, I don't even know any, everything. <laughs> so I think there's always a stereotype or something traditional that we, as a society, through history, we tend to believe this is what a woman should be and this is what a man should be. And you see that kind of clash with Socrates, right? Right, yeah, yeah, no doubt. Yeah, no and doubt. another thing that's interesting is that the topics that we touched, love, women, and religion, are topics that, again, you know, there's pre, you know, pre-thought, premeditated thoughts about how it should be, what it should be, and in core, we get to study them is what they are. And I guess I want to ask you a question about, you know, you asked us, and I want to ask you, you know, where do men, you know, would you rather be like Socrates or would you rather be like Odysseus? Oh, well, <laughs> you'd love to be a combination, though, a thinker and a warrior. No, right? um, I, think, I think as a man, the goal is to protect and provide. That's what we, that's my natural that's what I want, you know, and, and, and I know that, that the role of, of women is, I mean, it's huge, you know, I don't, but I, I want to provide and protect in a way that, you know, in a warrior's aspect, you know, like going out and fi go, going back to Penelope or, you know, fighting these battles back to mm -hmm. your gal, you know, or, you know, <laughs> but at the same, at, in, at the same time, I think similar to, to, to Socrates, I want to believe strongly about the right things. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So the, I think uh, a man has the responsibility of thinking about these issues, you know, thinking about, okay, how should I treat this lady or how should I... Uh, work in the household what should the roles be I think that those things are things worth thinking about and worth coming to uh, to positions on and 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 having it backed up logically in, in a way that that Socrates would would approve of you know so so it's a, it's a little bit of both you know you read a that's what's great you know about the core is you read some of these things and you find aspects that you like and aspects you know you don't like about about these characters you know so um, for me, I think that it's all about choice. Um, back to the topic about like what a woman should be and preconce preconceived notions of how a woman should um, act in our society. I think it's all about choice, um, especially um, like from experience watching my mother as I've grown up. Um, as a child, my mother was always like completely immersed in her occupation. She was always really busy and um, very successful and she was happy with that and then we moved to Georgia and she decided you know I'm going to focus on my family more um, I want to help my daughter do the best that she can through high school and get her into college and she made me her focus and I really appreciated and respected that choice that she made because I know it's not easy especially when her entire life was her occupation before me so um, I just think it's all about choice. And then you have to look at like over half of the workforce in the United States is female. So I mean there are women out there who go into the workforce and you know they are the Socrates of their company or they are the Odysseus of their company and they still go home and they take care of their family and um, I think something that has changed in our society is that family is seen as more of a unit where we work together whereas um, instead of the ideas that everybody has their very own role and this person does this and that person does that. Like, even in my family, like, sometimes I catch my dad trying to, like, do laundry even though a lot of times he messes it up. Like, <laughs> he tries. It's, it's the fact that we're a unit, like, we're a team. So, you know, if he sees that my mother is, is tired or he sees that my mother needs help with cooking or cleaning or anything like that, he helps her out. I think it, um, 
I think that something that I really took from all of these books is that um, no matter what day and age it is, we're going to struggle with the same things because we're human. And um, I think I'm just very thankful and blessed to be in the society that I am where we do change our ideas a lot. And um, our notions do shift. So our idea of family, our idea of women and men, those, those are things that never end. Those are things that are ever changing. And I'm very thankful to be in a society like that because I could say that I want to be this way at the age of 18 and I could be 32 and decide I want to be someone completely new and reinvent myself and I can do that. So I think um, that's something that's, that makes me really comfortable to be a woman or just to be part of the society in general. To have choices. Yeah. And also I see that what you said and what he said, because you said that your father helps your mother, mm -hmm. and then he said that he just wants to support someone. Like, all I see, all I can think of is love. And then you said your mom, you know, without her, mm -hmm. and that's just love. And even though a lot of ideas do change, right. love is something that doesn't change. And we can't really talk about love because there's been endless quotes and endless metaphors <laughs> and endless songs about love. Mm -hmm. But um, I really enjoyed your essay where you talk about love. And I was just wondering if you guys have seen it in any other books because it's something that doesn't change. It makes, well, just Shakespeare wise, it makes me think of Othello because we read that in high school. <laughs> and um, it's sort of like Shakespeare and love, it just seems like it just doesn't work for him. No, he's and, really pessimistic. But. And um, I guess uh, just asking, because I don't know how many Shakespeare works y'all read or if y'all read Othello, but like, do you think just Shakespeare just has a really bad view on love? Or is like, it like truthful? Like, what are you saying? I guess a combination of that. Um, okay. I don't know. I, I really love Shakespeare. Um, no matter how boring some people may think it is, I really, really love him. And I don't know. Even though I feel like sometimes I'm a hopeless romantic, something about his view of love is really interesting to me. Um, because usually when I am gung ho about something and I hear some that like somebody who's completely opposite, I want to know why. And I feel like Shakespeare tells you, like, like in my mind, I feel like in a lot of his work, Shakespeare is telling us that love is terrible and that he is just not for it. And it's all just like a figment of our mag imagination. And I want to know, like, why he feels that way. And I feel like he tries to present that. Like, for example, in Hamlet, he says, you know, love can't be real because deceit covers love. And how am I supposed to love someone who has done wrong to me? So then that makes me, like, that makes my ideals about love stronger because that makes me have to dig deeper. Well, like, why do I love people? Like, why do I love my parents? Why do I love my friends? Um, regardless of if someone does wrong to me, like, why do I still love them? And um, I think that just reinforces the idea that, you know, we're human. And that's part of this course, too, like, narratives of the self. Who are you? Um, you have to dig deeper. And just like the characters in each of, of the readings that we read, um, they had to dig, dig deeper in each of in each of those books, and I think that's something that we have to do as well. Hmm. I'm 20 years old. I know nothing of love, <laughs> although I have seen the Notebook. Um, <laughs> Lydia, you mentioned a good woman versus a bad woman, and y'all both, all y'all talked about women. So, what 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 is a a good woman, bad woman? What is that? What? It's a spectrum, but um, I think. <laughs> I think it's really hard to say like good woman and bad woman like I think it's just really hard because just like the true essence of a woman is just like the most amazing thing ever but then you have to think about the different things that woman went through the different things that woman had to do because she had no other choice and the circumstances and all of this and I think again it just reverts back to love like, what is a good woman and a bad woman like? Because it's just, it's hard to explain, but I just think, like, again, like, love is just coming all through that. Like, I don't think you can, like, label, like, good woman, bad woman. Like, okay, she's not in, like Homer did with Clymestra and Penelope. Clymestra uh, cheated on her husband, makes her bad woman, and Penelope stayed virtuous, so makes her good woman. I think uh, with anything you do, 
you can change, like Mariah said, you can change, come back from it. And it's all a process of not only love from other people, but love for yourself. So I think once a woman truly loves herself and understands her essence, like nobody can tell her anything. And like she can make herself in the image of the woman she wants to be. So I think like good woman, bad woman, I don't think anyone like outside of that woman can tell her what that is until she actualizes herself. Perhaps I will um, ask at this point for, uh, to see if there are uh, people from the audience who would like to join in this very interesting uh, discussion. Uh, we, uh, students, uh, you and professors, uh, uh, but, uh, so that everyone can hear this worked well with the keynote. I think what we'd like to do is ask those of you that like to um, uh, continue so everyone hears to come up to the mic here in the center. We could have a line there of people that would like to talk and please come close to the mic uh, because uh, uh, that way it will operate effectively and others can hear. Do we have some people that would like to, uh, uh, please, everyone is welcome and we have uh, plenty of time left. Okay, so when I read the Odyssey and my narratives of self class, we also looked at it from a, a different cultural standpoint. We looked at Romier's um, Black Odyssey, where basically he painted it through an African point of view. And in his um, vision, you see the women are kind of stronger and more leaders. So how do you guys think that cultural differences and diversity play into a woman's role? Um, okay. Uh, well, just like how you said, it's through like African American eyes. Like just from uh, my mom, like I just know like as an African American woman, she was like really strong. Like she stood for her family, just like my grandma. And I feel like it comes. It's like the difference of histories. And uh, I just speaking from like African American, uh, like your mom, your grandma, like they were your rock. And I feel like. A woman in like with like African like heritage and things like that. I feel like we paint these women way more like way more strong because like in America, as we know our history, we were African Americans were enslaved and everything. So they had to have a rock when uh, like their fathers were out or whatever, and their parent and their mothers were had the babies and everything. They were that rock for the children, and I feel like just like that culture and everything that came from the history made like the African-American woman way more like independent because she had to be. She didn't have time to wait for a man because a man could easily leave because he could be sold somewhere else. So that mom still had to keep with her children and still hold down the household. So I think it's just a different culture and a thing stands from history. Have, uh, have some of you in your uh, second semester course uh, read Beloved and uh, do you have uh, any comments to make on that text? No, I'm not talking. <laughs> okay. Uh, beloved is, yeah, it's like, it's so different. Like, it's just like different cultures who's like looking in on it. Because uh, one specific thing that stood out in my core class was when we talked about um, Beloved's mother, her mother, how she had all of these babies and she threw them overboard. And I feel like to someone who doesn't understand what she was going through, that she'd been raped multiple times by um, these men who were enslaving her, therefore she couldn't have these children and look at them, therefore she threw them overboard. I feel like it was, I still feel like she has a strength in her, even though these were her children, how she kept a beloved's mother because she uh, had her with an African American man or whatever. So I feel like, just like that difference right there, how her mother, even though she threw away her, her babies because of all the, like the rape she'd been through, the horror she's been through, but yet she's still standing and still like raised that child. Like I said, that says, that says a lot about her and her strength and her independence. So yeah, I love, the love it. I think also, like I, I just like Toni Morrison in general. Uh, my favorite book by her is The Bluest Eye. And I think that one's really interesting. And even going back to your question, when in the bluest eye, you're dealt with two different cultures. You're dealt with a, a little black girl who wants nothing but to have blonde hair and blue eyes. Um, and that 
brings us to the question again, like what is it to be a woman in one culture than to be a woman in another culture? What makes one better than another or not better than another? Um, I think Toni Morrison brings questions of who we are as women in all of her pieces. Um, my core class isn't as deep and beloved as, um, as I was in high school with like the bluest eye, so that's something that touches me like really deeply. But when I read that book, um, that was something really interesting to me because once again, it makes it makes you think within, and it makes you think like, well, why does she think that it's right to just be this one way, or why does she think that think why does she think that it's right to to look one way, or that because she looks one way, she's a better woman, or she'll be a better girl, and. Um, I don't know, I think that Morrison brings to play the idea that, you know, you're supposed to find beauty in whatever situation you're in, whatever culture that you're in. Um, the same beauty that I can see in myself as an African American woman, I see in a Caucasian woman, or I see in an Asian woman, um, or Hispanic woman. I just feel like it's, um, it's very fluid um, in terms of like, how we view each other, but it also goes back to what she says of how you view yourself and how you present yourself. If you don't have self-respect and if you don't have self-love, then how do you expect people who aren't in your culture, um, nonetheless within your culture, to view you? So I think it's how we present ourselves as women and how supportive we are as women with within our culture and without our culture. And following up on that, um, how you guys are speaking on the history, do you think that that influences what you believe about women today? Like, did that influence the arguments in your papers, how you viewed yourself, and how you believe women should be independent? Is that because of the past history? I think so. I think that culture and history affect what we think a woman should be. Like, to the first question, a French woman, an American woman, or black woman won't have the same values. Much like history, we don't have the same values. Both of us had a sort of similar pathways that women should be what they want to be, that women should go towards, you know, have a choice. But if you ask someone in the Middle East, they're not going to say that, you know. Their opinion is going to be very different. So I personally think that our background, our history, influences what we believe. That makes me think of a picture that was like circulating on the internet where uh, there's like a Middle Eastern woman in a burqa and then there's a, a American woman in like a bathing suit and uh, both of them are um, saying like they're so, um, what is it, like just basically like uh, they're uh, they're because of the men, they're basically a reflection of the men. So like because the uh, Middle Eastern uh, woman, uh, stereotypically men are how people view it, like men are dominant, so the women are all oppressed, blah, blah, blah. And then for the American woman, oh, they're so free because they can show their bodies. But looking at it from the other standpoint, like a woman maybe in the Middle East are like, wow, they're over-sexualized by a man. But looking at from American woman, looking at a Middle Eastern woman, it's like, oh, wow, that's male dominance all over her. So again, going back to the different cultures and things, but at the end of the day, we're all women. And again, just like, loving yourself, self-respect, just like, once you understand you're as a woman, like I said, you're fine. But there's always that yeah. influence towards like all the work, so yeah, really good point. <laughs> I just think that, I think we have to be really careful when we look at ourselves as women and then women in other cultures, because just like that picture, um, you know, other people in other cultures may look at, you know, Western civilization and say that we are over-sexualized. And in our minds, that's us, that's our idea, our idea of being sexy. But, I mean, like, a lot of women do care about what men think about us. Like, a lot of us, like, we do want to present ourselves in a way that's um, appealing to men. So I don't really feel, I feel like we have to be, like, really, really careful when we go and, and we judge other cultures for how they present themselves. Um, because you don't know what it looks like from the outside looking in at us. So I, I just feel like like everything that I'm going to say is going to go back to what Amber Nicole said about, Amber Nicole said about, um, about self, about how you present yourself and about how you feel about yourself, because that's really what matters. But I just think that preconceived notions of other cultures is something that you have to be really careful with. And understanding. Yeah. Since we're uh, talking about other cultures, several of you mentioned that uh, in our section, we read the um, 
uh, story of uh, Sunyat, uh, uh, an African uh, epic that is somewhat similar to the Odyssey in a sense, and has both uh, heroes, has uh, male and women, a strong mother figure. I wonder if you have anything to, uh, uh, if that brings to mind any uh, comments um, in terms of the discussion we've been having. Uh, well, my main thing is like the language, the language part of it. I know this doesn't like directly connect to what we were talking about, but just like how talking about how Sunyata had so many different names and things like that. So again, just like how rich like our culture is, and then like I guess tying it in how religion, love, and women can have so many nuances within them, so many different outlooks and views, but yet it comes down to like still this single factor. And I really like Sundiata because uh, even happily it wasn't like I'm so many pages as the Odyssey, <laughs> but um, it still got like that point of point across that the Odyssey did. So I think like, again, like how uh, Tony talked about the Black Odyssey, like you have all these different interpretations of the same stories through different cultural lenses or societal lenses. And you can just learn so much by just that, by just understanding that even something as simple as this translation, which teachers are crazy about, you have to get this translation, not that, how it can affect how you view things. So being conscious of taking off your lenses of whatever you're going through or the American lens and things like that and looking at it with your most uh, clear eyes. So just like with everything. Yeah, and I'd say <clears throat> uh, something just great about the Sunyata story is this idea of coming out of oppression, a coming out of a you know rough situation. You know, Sunyata started from nothing to uh, king. You know, of an empire in in Africa. You know, in the same way, you know, women have had to overcome you know, huge obstacles or, you know, in similar to the religion thing, you know, you're, you have all these people who are against what you believe, you know, and you have to stay strong in that. And, you know, Socrates was killed, but he, in a way, rose above, you know, by holding fast to what he believed in the same thing, you know, with love or the women, you know, taking, you know, I think we are who we are uh, through how we handle adversity. You know, how, what the person that we become a lot of times is based on the bad things that have happened, you know, and, and that I think truly creates character. Um, so that's what I'd note about Sunyata um, and the rest of the stories. Do we have uh, others who would uh, like to participate in the conversation here? We still have time for a question or two, please. I'd just like to say to the, the women on the panel, um, I would like to give you a book that I think you would find interesting. Um, your voice and your conviction was heard. Um, um, Selena Resvani, she speaks about the next generation of women, and I think you represent your generation really well. And to the young man, um, I think you would like, if you haven't been exposed to John Maxwell's readings, when you talked about being a provider and being protective, I think you would love his readings so you can look for his, um, his books as well. Yes, please. I'm Arnie Sidman. I'm a trustee here at the university. And I'm, I come here, this is one of my favorite days of the year, to, to, see, you, to see you all. Uh, it, makes, it sort of validates why I care about this place. I think you just do beautifully. And when I think back about my own uh, time at school, you are so far f further along than I was in my life. In the, in the 50s and 60s when I was in college, that it's, uh, it gives me a, a good feeling about our future. Um, a comment and a, and, a, and a question. The comment is this. Uh, in a trip that I took to Sicily, we were shown residences that had been built around the year 400 BC, residences in almost pristine condition, actually. And we were shown a playroom floor in a basement of one of these residences. There was a woman in a two-piece bathing suit, 
not a bikini, a two-piece bathing suit. 400 BC. No question, woman, two-piece bathing suit. <laughs> the contractor obviously uh, knew what he or she was doing. You're right, we don't, we don't change. We really don't change. So the question now is, when you see a headline, women earn 77% less than men, do you accept that on its face and have a, that it has a quote meaning for you? Or do you wonder how that number was derived and try to get to the bottom of it? Or do you just say, this is the media, these are the politicians, these are the talking heads doing their thing and you simply disregard it? Well, I can't speak for all occupations, but um, I was in IB and I did a math project when I was in high school. And my math project was looking at the incomes of um, physicians and surgeons um, based on gender, because like I, w I want a plan to be a doctor. So um, that was something that's really interesting to me. And I found it like really weird that you can go through 12 to 18 years of school and work hard as you've ever worked in your entire life and still not amount enough to receive the same pay as a man. That's something that I don't accept. Um, that's something that doesn't sit well with me. And do I know if the, in my lifetime I as one person can change that for all women? No, but I do know that. That's knowing things like that is something that motivates me to not be my best as a woman but be my best as a person. So that's something that, like, if I myself can beat that, then that's, that's a good feat. And I hope that other women in our society and in the world are empowered to do the same. Yeah. Oh, oh good. In answering your question, I don't know if this is the right answer, but definitely the, right the second <laughs> one. <laughs> the second one where you question, you know, where does this data come from? You know, why is this? And I think that's what you did, you know. Mm -hmm. You wanted to be a physician, so you looked into physician. And I have looked into that too. And one of the reasons is that women leave for maternity. True. And employers don't want, you know, someone that leaves or, you know, they're more um, susceptible to um, diseases or retiring earlier because they have children or leaving because they have children. So that's one of those things that it's true, unfortunately, if you do look at the numbers. And, and you just have to do the best, you know, you physician, be the best physician you possibly can. And if you think you earn what you're making, if you think you can earn more, if you think you deserve more, you know, fight for it, go for it, show, you know, raise your voice. And I think that's, I, that's how I personally look at it. Yeah. But I liked your advice a lot. Because <laughs> um, I remember seeing that uh, on the internet and I was, and it's just like, this sort of fire get like Mariah said, you can work all this time and still make less than a man. And I feel like whenever I do something, like I just compete against everybody. Like I'm like how she said, be the best person. And I feel like it's gonna take time to do it. But then when you look at our society, it's like we're still sort of behind. Like we're still not where we think we should be. Because just like in Spanish class, I learned that there's several South American countries who've had female presidents, but America, well, the United States, who uh, says, oh, we're so progressive, we're in the forefront, we have not had a woman president, and we're still having women pay less than men. And it's something that I think our society really needs to truly confront, because I feel like things with women is taken so lightly. Like, um, people make all of these jokes uh, especially on social media, they make so many like sexist jokes and people just laugh them off and write them off. And I feel it's so too much of that and not enough people actually acting on it. Like this is actually a problem that a woman is working all, going through school, paying for all this, and yet she still can't make the same amount as a man. And so um, I'm definitely, when I get to where I can, or even starting now, I definitely want to push for like that same equality, not just for women, but for like, discrimination like in all things. Any other comments? 
Uh, we have run out of time. I thank you for your comments. Thank you for participating. And I want to once again uh, thank uh, the students and tell them uh, how proud I am of them. And please join me in uh, congratulating. <laughs>